guys, welcome to the Gathering House as we have a community celebration this week. Uh, our, our Gathering House family come together in many different ways, uh, live and through the internet, so praise the Lord for that in these times.
It's about peace at the table and healing so at the table. I will feast at the table of the Lord. of our membership in Christ Church. And uh, so on these times that we get to celebrate communion, we sort of, in a sense, get to renew our membership. And so I trust you have your elements there with you and your family unit and uh, that you're ready to uh, partake of the Lord's Supper today. Well, let me begin with some familiar words. Come to this sacred table not because you are worthy. Come to this sacred table, not because you must, but because you may. Come to testify, not that you are righteous, but that you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his true disciples. Come not because you have any claim on heaven's rewards, but because in your frailty and sin, we stand in constant need of heaven's mercy and help. Come not to express an opinion, but to seek a presence and to pray for his spirit. We are come together today in obedience of our Lord's command to partake of the Lord's Supper. And to its blessing and fellowship, all disciples of the Lord Jesus, who have confessed him before men and desire to serve him, may come. This is not our table, but the table of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we ask that you would shower us with your presence this day as we gather around your table. Father, make us mindful again of the broken body and the shed blood that guaranteed our salvation and our hope of eternal life. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that we can come to this table and remember all that he has done for us and that we may remember that we are part of his family and that we celebrate together in unity, in love, and in peace. So, Father, bless the celebration of our communion today. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. So on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So as we partake of the bread, let us partake together and remember that Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance that it was broken for each one of us. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So remember that Jesus said this cup represents the covenant in his blood. All of us who have become disciples of Jesus are part of that covenant. So drink in remembrance that Jesus Christ's blood was shed for each of us. And let us be thankful. Let us pray. Into God's gracious keeping we would commit one another. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon us and give us peace in our going out and in our coming in, in our lying down and in our rising up, in our labor and in our leisure, in our laughter and in our tears, until we come to stand before him on that day in which there is no sunset and no dawn. Through Jesus Christ our Lord and all God's people say, Amen.
Morning Gathering House, let's pray. Let's take the message that we listened to today from Pastor Brian in Hebrews, and let's put some excellent, excellent, excellent movement into our faith, and let's take advantage of this time right now that we're closer together and that we're, things are reopening. I pray that we take care of all of our ministry groups at the church and that you join us, whether it's online or in person. And I pray, Lord, please enable more people to show up at church and those that are at church to, to find the, uh, the ability and the guidance to uh, step out and, and uh, enjoy this time that we have together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, hello again, and uh, welcome to the Word of God this morning, and as we go to look at the whole theme of faith. And before we get into that, let me uh, again remind you of our outdoor service that is happening on the last Sunday of September, the 27th, and also to remind you that uh, you need to register for that service so that we know how many people are coming and we can prepare accordingly. And so you need to register with Christine, and we ask you to do that by this Wednesday coming, the 23rd of September. And just uh, keep that in mind. Also keep in mind that this service will be a morning service, and it will start at 10.30. And so uh, we look forward to seeing everyone. I'm hoping that uh, as many of you as can, can make it, and uh, allowing each of us to reconnect with one another. Be in prayer for the service, for the weather, for the setup, and so on. So we'll look forward, again, Make sure Christine knows you're coming and call her or email her by the 23rd of September. So over the next few weeks, we're going to look a little closer at faith. And uh, there's a series that we're going to look at over the next few weeks uh, that is entitled Neon Faith. Neon Faith. And if you were to be asked how to define faith, you would probably have your way of defining it and give some idea of what you think faith is all about. But we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11 and the first couple of verses of chapter 12, and we're going to see that faith has some different elements, that faith can be described in different ways. And so today, we're going to look at faith as a radical faith. And then in two weeks, we're going to look at authentic faith, and then on the 18th of October, we're going to look at faith as scandalous, simply because grace can be scandalous. And then our final message at the end of October, we'll be talking about enduring faith. And so with that in mind, we want you to uh, turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. And uh, we'll be looking at different verses in Hebrews chapter 11 today. As we look at the theme of radical faith, this is the first in, the, in four messages about neon faith. And when we talk about faith, we often use this word because we put our faith in all kinds of things. We put our faith in certain friends, and then later we are hurt by those individuals. We put our faith in certain companies, and we become very disappointed in how those companies react and act in their business. We put our faith in politicians, and we find sometimes our faith turned in, turns into disillusionment. We've put our faith in different religious leaders and churches and found ourselves hurt again. And we all know what it is to put our faith in something and then to find it ultimately disappointing. If you're a sports fan like I am, then putting your faith in a team is a whole new ball game, and we might put it that way, and you know the disappointment that teams can bring if you're a, an avid fan, and I'm not going to mention any team names at this time, uh, you can just evaluate your own life. And certainly, second only to sports, I think, are the financial shakedowns that we've experienced in our culture and the uh, stresses that we've had, such as in 2008, and, and even now as we work through this pandemic and uh, the loss of markets and trying to regain them. 
And all of that tests our faith. And even at some point, we have to try to rekindle our faith in those systems. One of the things that has been really tragic as we look at this whole area of faith are seeing how many individuals who are in this sector of losing faith, whether financially or relationally, have used this platform to make the ultimate decision and to take their own lives. And there is story after story of people who have done this. And not only the ones told in the paper, but also the ones we hear around the water coolers at work or in conversations with friends about people who have placed their faith ultimately in something that wasn't ultimate. And they had placed their faith and their trust and their hope on things that were not worthy to have that faith, hope, and trust pinned on them. And the result was incredible disillusionment and pain and heartache. Some of you today may have placed your faith in romance and love, and we've pursued it with all of our heart, only to be crushed and broken on the backside of it. Some of us have placed our faith in any number of relationships that have hurt us and damaged us. Some of us have placed our faith in politics, and while politics can do a lot of good and accomplish a lot of good things, we've been hurt in the midst of that. So what I want to talk to you about is what this aspect of faith means in our lives and what it means to place our faith and trust in God and grow in our faith. And as I said earlier, this is a series of four messages we're calling Neon Faith. And Neon Faith is about experiencing God's light through Jesus Christ shining into our life and then us shining that light into the world to make a difference. Neon faith is about putting our faith in something that won't ultimately destroy us or harm us. It is putting our faith in something that is truly ultimate, so no matter what happens in our lives, it will stand up and it will carry us through. In Hebrews 11, verse 1, it says, Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things that we cannot see. And I want you to notice that this isn't so much a definition of faith as it is a description of what faith does. It gives us confidence and it gives us assurance of things we can't see. Later in Hebrews we read, through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. The majority of Hebrews chapter 11 is going to tell us about these kind of people who overcame and received that good reputation for their faith. People like Moses and Abraham, Noah, Rahab, David. These are wonderful and amazing people of faith. And it says, as we continue, by faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. The whole creation is a faith element. If we want to live with faith, if we want to experience more faith in our lives in God, more faith that won't leave us disillusioned and disappointed, then the first challenge we see in Hebrews chapter 11 is this. Learn to see with faith. Learn to see with faith. Faith becomes a way of seeing. The New York Times several years ago asked their readership to submit their own definition of what faith is. And they received almost 1,200 comments. And some people said, faith is the suspension of reason and it's the suspension of rationality for a dream. One person said, faith is a feeling that you, and by extension the world, is just awesome. Another person said, faith is a socially acceptable insanity. And 
one final person said, faith is what other people have. I have debt. So what does the Bible say faith is? And again, this isn't so much a definition. And I want us to look at that verse again. It's a description. In verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 11, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. Faith is a confidence. It's a belief. It's not just a casual attitude of, hey, things are going to work out. And it's not like you walk down the street and you say, I'm going to have faith. I'm going to believe that today someone is going to pull over and write me a million dollar check. I'm going to believe it and think it. And there are books like that. And others out there that say that that's what you should do. It's just blind faith that all of life comes back to this sort of radical faith that is not anchored to anything. This is not what the Bible is talking about. It is a confidence, and it is an assurance. As you'll see as you read it on in the context of Hebrews chapter 11, that is based on the promises of God. It's a confidence and an assurance that God has revealed himself in his word. And God will be faithful to the promises he has made. And there are thousands of promises in the Bible, and God will honor each of those promises. And it's a confidence that no matter what I'm going through, that around it and through it, God is working and moving to fulfill his good purpose. Even if I can't see it, he's doing it. And that's how faith operates. If you look at the next sentence, in that verse, it says, it gives us assurance about things we can't see. And when you have that kind of confidence in God, He's going to be faithful to His promises. You are able to rest a little bit, even though you can't always see how things will work out. Faith is like when you don't have good sight and you put your glasses on. It just changes everything. And when you don't have your glasses for a time and you finally put them on, it reminds you of how much you needed those glasses. The world becomes so much clearer. Things have dimension. It's a good deal. You don't trip over stuff all the time. And a lot of good things happen when you can see. The exact same thing is true of faith. And before someone becomes a Christian, their life is flat. It is one-dimensional. And you really struggle to find meaning and purpose in it all. But when you begin to learn to see with faith, your life becomes alive in a lot of different ways. Even the little mundane things that you did every day become actions that were part of a bigger plan that God was working on in the world. Even our simple old life took on a whole new meaning because we are now seeing it with faith. Problems take on a different meaning because you are now seeing them with faith. And when you don't have faith, often all you see are the problems. And some of you are looking around right now and you are saying something like, all I have are problems. All I can see are problems. I want to assure you this morning that when you start seeing through the eyes of faith, you start seeing differently. You realize that other things are happening than just what you can see. And when you start looking at your life through the eyes of faith, you realize God is working behind it and around it. No matter how difficult our situations may be, we have a God who is all over those things. And he can provide you with your needs. He has promised that he will meet those needs. We have a God who will walk with us no matter how 
tough thing to get. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And we have a God that can sustain us and give us power and strength no matter what we are facing in life. You really start to see your life differently. So here's the deal. When you see with faith, you don't just see your problem. You tell God about your problem, and then you tell your problem about your God. Do you know what I'm saying? Have you ever done that? And sometimes you just need to stop and say, God, let me just tell you how big this problem is. It's big. It's nasty. It's ugly. And then you need to pause after that and remind yourself that I need to remind my problem of how big my God is. He's bigger. He's better. He's stronger. He's tougher. And you know, the whole world is in his hands. And the Bible says he loves me, he cares for me, and he walks with me. And what's happening? You and I are learning to see with faith. In Hebrews 11, we meet many of the different individuals that live by faith. They are celebrated throughout the chapter, and we often call Hebrews chapter 11 the Hall of Faith. And when you get down to verse 33, toward the end of the chapter, it's an overview of these people who did great things. And it says this, By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, they quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness, and you have to hear this, I love this, was turned to strength. Their weakness was turned to strength. How many of you this morning wouldn't mind having your weakness turned into strength? And faith is the way that happens. Faith in God, trust in Him, trusting His promises and being assured that He's working even in the unseen details of our lives. Their weaknesses were turned into strength. They saw with faith. Not only that, but if we want to live extraordinary lives of faith, we need to see with faith. But then, and again, keep this in mind, we keep looking up even when things are down. We all know people who represent both sides of the half full, half empty continuum. There are people who are extreme pessimists and then there are those who are extreme optimists. And we all know people like that. As good and positive as optimism is, sometimes these people can drive you crazy, right? They are looking on the bright side of everything. And I want to make a distinction at this point. When we are talking about faith, we're not just talking about optimism. It's not like a per person of faith wakes up and says, hey man, it's going to be a good day. Why? Because it is. How do you know that? I just do. Can you feel it? Do you know what I'm talking about? That's not necessarily faith. Faith says it's going to be a good day. Why? Because this is the day that the Lord has made. And I'm going to rejoice in it. It doesn't mean I won't face difficulties. It doesn't mean I won't get down. It doesn't mean I won't be depressed today. It doesn't mean I won't be frustrated. It doesn't mean today I won't want to quit. I may want to check out. But through it all, I'm going to learn to rejoice because this is God's day. And my faith is in Him. This is the day the Lord has made. 
And when I'm depressed, I'm going to remember that he's the one who can lift me up. When I feel hopeless, I'm going to remind myself that he's the one that can give me hope. And when I don't know where else to turn, I'm going to turn to him. And when I don't know where else I can find the resources to meet the basic needs of my family, I'm going to trust him for that too. When I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, I'm going to follow God. I don't even know ultimately where I'm going in the future, but I know who I'm going to follow in the future. I'm going to follow God. And that's what it means to look up, even when things are looking down. That's what it means to live with a neon faith. Say, God, my heart is yours today. My life is yours today. I'm following you today. I'm going to live with faith. I'm going to trust that you are working in my life. In Hebrews 11, the writer chronicles several of the individuals that did amazing things. They ruled kingdoms. They shut the mouths of lions. And we sit there and hear those stories and we're full of oohs and ahs. And it's amazing. And then you get down to verse 35 and it says, but others, so not everybody was amazing and not everybody always experienced these miraculous things, but others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. These people faced religious persecution they, and they placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. It goes on to say, some were jeered, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. So what is the writer of Hebrews saying? He's saying, you keep looking up, even when things look down. Sometimes when you do that, you see God come through in a huge way in your life. Sometimes he says, these is individuals went all the way to their death and never saw the promise ultimately fulfilled in their life, but they looked forward to the resurrection. They looked forward to the time when they would be united with God. And the Bible tells us that no matter how bad things may get, no matter how tough they are, a day will come when we will be in heaven with him. And the Bible says there will be no more crying, no more mourning, no more suffering, no more pain. And we'll be able to experience God and experience one another and experience this awesome relationship with Him that He so desires for us. Now that's what's going to be amazing. So people with faith look up even when they are down. They look all the way up and realize that God will ultimately make it right. And I want to trust him today in my life. So, friends, if that's what faith looks like, let me ask you this. What does it look like for you in your life today? And for us to experience this neon faith, it's not just to learn to see differently and make a commitment to say, I'm going to keep looking up even when things are down because of who God is. It's also a commitment to say, I'm going to step out in faith. I'm going to act in faith. I'm going to do what God is calling me to do. So what is he calling you to do? For some of you, you sense he's leading you to take a step and make a decision of some kind in your life. Some of you are afraid about that. And just the thought of stepping out in faith is like, oh, I don't know. That sounds kind of dangerous. And there are a lot of dangerous things that we can do in our lives. A Christian comedian 
said this about danger. I heard of a woman that went skydiving recently on her 92nd birthday. Now that's dangerous. Picking a child into Toys R Us to buy batteries, that's dangerous. Asking a woman when she's due, even when you are not really sure if she's pregnant or not, that's dangerous. Been there, done that. Pretending not to hear the baby crying, that's dangerous. Drinking the milk after the expiration date, that's dangerous. And thinking that a skunk is a lost cat with bad hair, that's dangerous. There are a lot of dangerous things out there. But what you may be engaging in if you suppress that calling from God may be way more dangerous than the thing that God is calling you to do. He loves you and cares about you. And whatever he's going to call you to, he's going to see you through it. He'll walk with you in it. Maybe for some of you, it's having a tough conversation this week. Maybe for some of you, it's forgiving a friend or neighbor or roommate and saying, let's let the past be the past and let's move on in our lives. Maybe for some of you, it's just acknowledging, I have entrusted God with my finances in my life. Maybe it's sharing your faith with a friend. You sense God is leading you to do it and you are saying, no, please God, not that friend. But it keeps coming back, so you are like, oh, all right, all right. Maybe it's jumping into neon faith. For some of you, the idea of jumping in and joining a small group is like, whoa. I have to sit around with people and stuff. That's a little more involved than what I want to be in church. I kind of like slipping in and slipping out. It's good for me. Maybe this is the step that God is calling you to do. Maybe it's committing. Maybe for some of you, it's stepping out for the first time and asking Christ to be the leader and forgiver of your life. It's realizing that faith is something you have never expressed publicly or openly to God. Maybe this is your opportunity to do that. This morning, I just believe there are some folks throughout the land, throughout our churches, that are thinking, I don't know if I'm ready for that. Yet you know that God has been moving in your life. You know that he is calling you to step out in faith and trust him. And I think, friends, some of you have denied it. You've continued to push it off. But this could be the actual time. Today could be the day when you reach out and you receive his grace. You look back and say, the journey really took a turn for me there, a turn for the better. And it's all of these points that we begin to live out in a neon faith. And that's why we can call this faith so radical. Because it can do a lot of things. It can make a lot of changes and bring a lot of peace. And I trust you can live in the knowledge of having that neon faith with God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our faith. Lord, we thank you even more that you are the person that that faith is anchored in. And Father, I pray that whatever you're leading us to do or respond with in these days, I pray that we would have that radical faith, that neon faith, to step out and trust you. Lord, that if we're in the midst of deep circumstances, dark times, whatever it may be, that we may be able to look up and not always look down, that we may trust you and know that you are working behind the scenes. But Father, first and foremost, I pray that if there are those who do not know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, that they would ask you into their lives and establish this neon faith for now and forever. Father, I ask that you would work in the hearts and lives of all of us as we grow and develop our own neon faith. For it's in Jesus' name we pray with much thanksgiving. Amen.
next song, Guide Me, Lord, is uh, one I pray about a lot. We've been deep back into the old country songs. Uh, Merle Haggard. Uh, Merle Haggard is kind of a, a guy I love to follow because uh, he was real. He was a real sinner. He was real, and he uh, was uh, transformed and became a believer. So. <clears throat>
Blue 